not necessarily uh, treaties between, or you know, historical colonial treaties between the British people and all of the Amerindian or indigenous groups that are in Guyana's interior, and that's just because there are uh, mass many of them. Uh, when you look at how colonialism or how colonization happened, Guyana that we know today was colonized by the Dutch and then it was colonized by the British. The Dutch way of doing colonization was to build roads that led to the mines and towards whatever resources they wanted to extract. So for instance, for my family lives in Guyana, we have one road and let's follow that road all the way to the end, you know that you're going to a mine. That's just the Dutch way of doing uh, colonialism. It was to get in, get the resources and get out. The British, they more so had a type of settlement pattern way of doing uh, resources where they settle in lands where they thought that the land was fertile for growing crops, having plantations and slaves over and indentured servants over, and they settled in that way. And so British settlement was much more dispersed. And also the British settlement it never went as deep into Guyana as such settlements did precisely because uh, you know they feared diseases, they feared uh, how much more development they would actually need to do or take on to clear out forests and stuff. And so many of the agreements were more so, we're not coming in that deep anyway, so we'll just leave you alone. And I think that that's important to point out because even though uh, Burnham ended up being the independence leader in Guyana due to US maintaining interference, and there were many issues with Burnham's conception of socialism, uh, if you could call it that, given his alliance with the United Forces Party, one thing that his goal, Burnham's goal with socialism did do in Guyana was that upstate in South America and in the Caribbean, Guyana had some of the most progressive laws as it regards indigenous groups. Uh, and I know indigenous groups because I'm talking about Amerindian peoples and also maroon communities that are in Guyana and Suriname. But what that means is that a lot of those groups were allowed to be left alone and live as they live. And so you have a running joke in Guyana which says, well, of course we have the most progressive indigenous or, you know, laws in South America or in the Caribbean because Guyana doesn't develop itself so it just doesn't develop. But that is also a progressive way of, you know, interacting with or handling indigenous groups and communities is making sure that they can maintain uh, their historical, traditional, and cultural ways of life and interacting as much or as little with the state as they want to end on their terms. And so, um, over the past six years, I would say you have seen indigenous groups in Guyana become more political and become more involved in politics, given coastal politics of extraction. And so when these indigenous groups, for instance, saw the Exxon Mobil was there, you saw a lot of them coming into Georgetown into the capital to say, if waters are poisoned up here, they're going to flow downstream and they're going to come into our community and present a problem for us. And so they're able to do that only because uh, there are causes that grant them certain rights, saying that their lands are to be left alone as they are, uh, and as long as they're maintaining the land. And you know, again, there's questions of who gets to say how well or how badly they're maintaining the lands or not. Um, you had bad experiments with this under Burnham, where he wanted to have all food production in Guyana be local. And so some indigenous communities were producing food, but there was never any real plan to get food from the interior to the capital. And so those food negotiations are doing and fail. But nonetheless, what it creates is the relationship between interior indigenous groups and you know, coastal government at, at the state level, where they could go and have complaints or some sort of interaction with the state. And so indigenous groups in Guyana uh, they're autonomous, so they have a lot of agency in the sense that the Guyanese state itself isn't necessarily going into the interior to develop the interior. And they also have a lot of rights that regard the maintenance of the land. So not only uh, if they quote unquote destroy the land, but also if the land is being destroyed by the state, they can go and levy court grievances. And so actually one of the first cases levied against Exxon Mobil in Guyana, so against Exxon Mobil and the government, was by an indigenous boy from the Rukini to Nexana, and he was assisted by a black professor at Georgetown University. And what he was saying is that uh, 
the Exxon Mobil and oil is going to destroy the world away from the Mediterranean. That was something that he wanted to address. And so this was also something that people have neglected in when we talk about Venezuela or Diana Pension, is that the border and as the people who get forest and indigenous groups talk and people talk in general. And so it is the case that many indigenous groups in Guyana view themselves as having more rights than indigenous 